going for it? Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Four, and I'm the Communications Administrator here at the MISC. And my name is uh, Petros Psaroudis, and I'm the Special Events and Conferences Coordinator at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Thank you. <laughs> so it gives us a lot of pleasure to introduce our next guest. As big hockey fans, uh, getting to do this is certainly one of the perks of our job. Our next speaker is a familiar name to pretty much everybody in the room. He's had a big career in the NHL, playing for the Edmonton Oilers, the Phoenix Coyotes, the Pittsburgh Penguins, and our very own Montreal Canadiens. Since retiring from hockey, he's also very active in federal politics as the deputy leader of the Green Party of Canada. And he's an activist in many causes, including uh, he's building a hospital in Haiti with World Vision, and he's very active on the file of animal rights. Ladies and gentlemen. Mesdames et messieurs. Georges Larac. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, and thanks for the invite. It's so nice to be here and uh, be sharing my story with you guys. And I've always loved uh, to those conferences and talk to uh, a lot of people about cultural and uh, about, you know, playing hockey in Canada and about the road that I had to take uh, to be in the NHL because uh, in my life it wasn't an, uh, an easy road because, as you know, my parents were born in Haiti. And uh, still today, I still feel fortunate that uh, I'm alive because uh, of the earthquake that y you guys all know that happened. Uh, maybe if my parents at 20 years old and decide to come to Montreal, maybe I wouldn't be here today. So that's why every time I have a chance to speak and talk about what happened in my road and the way I was brought up, to me it's really important. And, uh, you know, when my parents came to Montreal, uh, like most kids um, growing up in Montreal, I wanted to play hockey. My parents didn't like hockey too much because they didn't like the cold. Um, and I remember when I was a kid, they, when they go to the rink, bring me to the rinks, they, they were wearing, wearing three winter jackets because uh, they, they were so cold when they were going there. So when I was telling them I wanted to play hockey, uh, they let me play, but they didn't really like it too much. So we didn't watch a, any hockey at home. And uh, to me, what was interesting about hockey is the fact that there was no role models for me when I was a kid and I wanted to play. Uh, often when you're a kid and, and you look, uh, especially when you're a minority, you look towards uh, sports that have more minorities and, and you pick a role model and that's what you want to do. Um, when I was young, I was playing hockey, soccer, and football. So those are the three sports that pretty much I had a choice um, that I could pick um, to make it professionally. I was really blessed. I was really, always had great genetics. I was really lucky. And again, I look at when you analyze the three sports uh, in Canada, uh, you look at hockey, football, and uh, soccer. I knew that hockey in Canada, you have more chance to succeed than all the other sports because if you want to play American football, you have to go in the States. And if you want to play soccer, you have to go in Europe. So really, when you look at those three aspects, hockey I knew was the sport that if I wanted to succeed, uh, is a sport that, that I had to stay with. But one of the biggest reasons why I picked hockey is because when I was younger, um, all the racism that I had to endure, um, you know, every day, I've never heard once people tell me that, you know, hockey is white man's sport, you're never going to make it. And that's also why I wanted to, do, why I picked hockey, because I wanted to pick the sport that was going to be the hardest, the sport that I had to endure all the racism when I was a kid, because I knew one day there'd be other minorities that had to go through the same road as me, that difficult road then. It's, it's with people like me that, that, goes, and that goes over those barriers that, that inspire other kids to, you know, to play through that. And when I was younger, I read Jackie Robinson's book when I was going through uh, some hard time because of parents and shouting names at me from the stands and from the bench. And uh, when I read his book and I saw what he was going through as the first black player that played Major League Baseball when he was younger, um, I, I started to find it normal, the fact that I was going through the same obstacle as he was. I, I just realized that, you know, those obstacles is something that I have to go through, I have to endure to make it to the NHL. And I started using it as a motivation. You know, when you're a kid and people always tell you that you're never going to be able, able to achieve something or do anything because of your race, your culture, or anything, often people just quit and they think it's too hard and they don't want to do it. And they're like, oh, man, that's, that person must be right. Or you could use that as a motivation to prove them wrong. And that's what I wanted to do. So all those years, every time people were just shouting stuff at me, it was just give me extra motivation. Because even though I picked hockey, hockey was never my favorite sport. 
soccer wise because my my parents uh, played professional soccer in Haiti and uh, because uh, you know we, that's what we were watching at home all the time that's what it, that's the sport I like the most but just because I wanted to prove a point and I really wanted to show everyone that if you tell me that I can do something that's why I wanted to do also because I'm really stubborn that's why I, st I st stuck and I stay with hockey and the great thing about that too when I picked hockey is, is again in Canada the program for hockey and schooling is really good um, back in the time uh, in the days when I was playing junior hockey um, most of the team were in Quebec so they weren't in the Maritimes like they are now so we were always uh, studying we're more sitting in school we're going to see Jeff so we were really lucky I think the longest road trip we had was five hours or now today it's more 10 12 hours so I think that Today they should focus a little bit more on education because many players that play junior hockey won't make it to the NHL. So I think the education program is really important. But for me, I was lucky. I went to school, I finished my CJEP, and I was studying to be a lawyer in case if my hockey career wasn't going to work. So uh, uh, this is something that I still intend to to do and finish my law school one day because uh, you know you remember all those years when you're a kid and you're studying every day and you don't sleep for exam and 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 you know you always want to get ready. And because you play sport, when you quit all that, if I don't have a diploma in my wallet, it's like all those years of studying, not sleeping, and taking wake-up pills to, stud to study for an exam, it's like for nothing. So I'd like to have a diploma in my wallet just to say, just so people can say that I was just a hockey player because you know the stereotypes that comes with that. So to me, it's really important to, uh, especially the fact that I have twins, to be a good role model in terms of show that I succeeded in sport and also in schooling, which is so important. So. When I grew up and, uh, and I was studying again for my parents, um, when I was telling them that uh, I wanted to be in the NHL, and I was going to be in the NHL, obviously they were laughing at me and, you know, what are the chances that's going to happen, right? So even though I knew the chances were zero, 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 zero point, a million, one percent, it didn't matter to me. I didn't look at the chances. I said the chance is too hard. That's what I'm going to do. So I, that's the role that I picked. And my parents were really hard on me in schooling. Uh, schooling is so important for everybody. I went to Collège Brebeuf uh, in Montreal, and uh, actually it was funny because I needed to play rep in a rep league, uh, double uh, letter league, to be able to play in the NHL because to be drafted junior hockey and to go up, you need to play in the rep leagues. But the private college that I was going to, there was too much studying, there's too much schooling, so I needed to go to your ordinary school to be able to play hockey. So uh, after my, in my second year when, uh, when I was in Brebeuf, I failed three courses on, on purpose, so then I could go to a normal school. And um, the way we were raised, it was really hard, like hard line. My parents were uh, really hard on us in school, and uh, my dad uh, was, uh, you know, beating us pretty hard uh, if we didn't have A grade because we all, had, all needed to have A grades to be able to play hockey and to do sports. Otherwise, we weren't going to play. So I had to endure a lot of... Uh, beating uh, just for filling those three courses. But I knew if I did that, the year after, you would let me go to a normal school. And when I went to the uh, summer school in the summer, and I, I wasn't even listening to the teachers, I got over 100% for those three courses, the guy called my father and asked him what was wrong with me because uh, he didn't understand why I was even there in the summer school. And that's when my dad realized that I did that on purpose so I could play hockey. So it just showed you when you have a mission and, and you really want to do something, you'll do whatever it takes to make it. And right after that, he, he, my dad told me, he said, you want to go to a normal school, that's fine. You have to have a 99 average, otherwise you're not going to play hockey. So that was fine. If you, when you go to a private school to a normal school after, it was so easy. You didn't have to study. So I had lots of fun. I didn't have to study much. I just played hockey. <laughs> and then uh, that, that, that right, right away, the next year, I got drafted junior hockey, and then things went pretty fast. And made it to the NHL, and the funny part about that is because my entire family schooling is so important. When I did that, I was pretty much the only one that was not going to a private school, so they all thought I was a bum because I wanted to play hockey instead. But when I got drafted to the NHL, and I made it to the NHL, now they all wanted to be my friends, which, which was pretty awesome. And uh, you know, I was given the hockey tickets after they thought that I was a bum because I took that road. But again, it, to me, it didn't matter. I just I, I had this mission and then needed to do it, and, and, and I felt so fortunate. So in 95, when I was drafted by the Oilers in the second round, it was obviously the start of a dream because uh, even though you're drafted, uh, there's nothing um, that, that is guaranteed that you're going to make it to the NHL. But, you know, the fact that I was in the second round and only had to play two years in minors, to me it was something that, um, that was just amazing. Playing eight years in Edmonton, 
playing in Phoenix and Pittsburgh and finishing up in Montreal, uh, playing 13 years in the NHL, to me, I felt, I felt really blessed. The only one thing, though, that I have to say about my career, is, which to a lot of people is always surprising, is that I didn't like the fighting, <laughs> which is what I did for a living when I played hockey. I have over 130 fights in 13 years, so it was never something that I was really proud of, um, you know, because in a way, you know, when you fight in, in hockey, you kind of promote violence, and when you look at kids that they play hockey and peewee uh, at them, they all do the same. They fight. They do what we were doing. So um, to me, it was that what I needed to do to be there, but it was never, it was never inside of me. I, was, I never fought angry. I was never upset. I always talk to the guy before and wish him good luck and ask him after if it was okay. In the beginning, in, in the beginning, people thought I was crazy because, like, is that guy nuts? Because, you know, how could you tell somebody good luck and ask him if he's okay after? But after the, after the years, people got to realize that, you know, I was just a human being and I just really didn't want to hurt anyone because you have to realize that those people, they have families, they have kids, and they have a life. There's a life after hockey. And, you know, as much as the fans, you look at fighting on TV and you realize, you're like, you, you love that and you like the violence. Um, you know, if you hurt, if you kill someone, you're the one that has to live with that. And that's why it's so important to realize that the human being and not to never, ever think that it's easy and it's a fun thing to do because I've talked to many fighters over the years and I don't know any of them that likes to do so, you know. Um, you know, I would love to have uh, the hands like Jagger and score 50 goals a year without having to break a sweat and make three to four times what I was making. But, you know, I needed to use my hand in, in a different way and and my hands were concrete with the puck, so I had to fight with them. So that's why I did that. And, and I still feel fortunate because uh, still 13 years and, and playing and, and having over 153 points and a hat trick and a lot of stuff that I took pride of because obviously for a tough guy, having a hat trick usually is only what you could have in dreams. And, and having in actually a, a real one in Edmonton, the first team that I played for, was something that I'll never forget. But, you know, I still feel fortunate that, that I was there. And, uh, you know, I just hope that nobody ever gets hurt uh, in fighting in hockey because I know it's dangerous. And I know that uh, there's lots of debate in the fact that whether they should be fighting or not. And uh, to me, because that's what I did for a living, I would never spit on what put bread on the table for me. So I would always defend it. And if they take it out one day, it won't be because of me. So that, to me, is always something that I really want to emphasize because, you know, people have to understand that what you do on the ice, the job that you do, doesn't often define you as a human being. So while I was playing hockey, that's why to me it was really important to get involved outside of hockey so people could get to know the real person. And that's why I became a Green Deputy Leader of the Green Party. Um, and that actually started once, once I became vegan, which was my last year in Montreal. I saw a documentary and then that changed my entire life. Um, I was the biggest meat eater in the world before I was eating three or four meals. I, like meals a day with, with, with big steaks and stuff. And when I saw the documentary, I stopped. I threw everything away from my, uh, that I had in the fridge and I started from scratch and I changed my entire life and uh, I never felt better. Um, you know, I decided to, to be vegan for animals, for the environment and, uh, and uh, for my health. And I was suffering for high blood pressure and asthma and after five months only of changing my habits, uh, it, it was cured. So I've learned so much about it, met, talked to so many doctors, naturopath, that I started doing conference about it. Uh, I own two raw vegan restaurants, Cure d'Essence in Montreal, and, and every, every week we help people carrying a lot of problems that they have by just changing the way they eat. So I, could, I, I won't get into it because that's aside the point, because I could really talk about this for hours, because that's to me a subject that's really important and inspiring for me. And, and it's often the new generation that is interesting about it because I know the old generation live for 50, 60 years the same way, so they're not going to change their habits. But, <laughs> but the new generation, they're the one living through that environment, and it's now that the food has really changed. Our food chain is not the same as, uh, as it used to be and what, what's injecting in our, in our food and everything. But anyway, that's because of that reason that that's once I turned green and I became vegan because that's the strongest action you could do for the environment. Then Elizabeth May came to Montreal, asked me to be a deputy leader. I didn't want to do it at first because uh, I don't really like politics. But when she came to Montreal, then how could you say no to her? She came to my place and convinced me she was going to grind my throat if I didn't say yes. So I said, OK. Uh, so I accepted to do it. And actually, to help the party, I, I, I'm doing it for free. So when I do conference and we have 307 writings, I go around and I talk about the thing that a like, passion for me, which is uh, 
health, uh, having people be more active, because especially kids, because now kids are sitting in front of the TV all day long, they don't play anymore, they play all those video games, they're not active, and they're suffering with overweight problem. And back in the days, we're always playing outside, we're always active, so to me it's important to have our kids more active. Maybe back in my days, we had an Atari, that's why we didn't want to play video games. An Atari with one button and that's it, so it was boring, so you ready to play outside and play video games, so it's different. But it, to me, it's so important to encourage that, to encourage food, animal rights, and, 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 and encourage people to be uh, more green. Because even though we talk about the Green Party, and even though we only have one, one seat, you know, if I, could, if I could inspire more people to be green, whether you vote conservative, whatever you want to vote, then we're all winners. You know, if all Canadians could do a little measure to, to be green and inspire the kids to be, well, we're going we're gonna to be benefits from that. So that's why I think that often politics, they focus too much on their own party than the message. And that's why I tend to give a different message when I talk about that. And that's why, to me, again, those are the stuff that is really important. Once you become a role model, it's what you do with um, the fact that you're known uh, in the society, in the world, that, that it's important. That it, and that's the stuff that, that will change and will improve life of others. Because again, hockey is, is just a sport. It's just a game and nothing else. And I do think that in Montreal, it's hockey. We put too much emphasis on hockey. You know, hockey is like a religion here, and that's too big. It's, it's unbelievable what it does to people. It changed people's mood when you watch hockey here. If your team are losing, people are upset, they go to work, they're upset, they can't work. Like, there's things more important in hockey in life. You know, this, the coverage that we give to hockey is so big that if we just took a small percentage of it and we gave it to some charities, we would save lives. You know, lives, we save kids. But every day in the paper, just why we have to listen to hockey 24-7 on the radio? Why, when there was the lockout, we were listening to the TV all the, every day, listening about, there's going to be hockey, there's not going to be hockey, there's going to be hockey, it's not going to be hockey. It was unbelievable. It was like a soap opera, and people were listening to it. They were like, yes, it's back. Oh, no, it's not. It was, it was unbelievable. So I was just glad there was nothing, because wh while there wasn't any hockey, people didn't have to complain. So we were all winners. And now that it's back, now every time you turn on the radio, you hear people not happy about this, about that, about this. But it's just that I, when I talk about that, I just have to tell people to relax and to realize that the thing's more important and uh, to enjoy their life and to, to do things that matters and to help out people with charities and to help out people that are around us because there's things so much more important. And that's why to me, as an athlete, it's so important to talk about that stuff because I do realize that I was fortunate the life that I was. And that's also why I try to give back as much as I can, like the hospital in Haiti. Again, I've talked about it before, the fact that my parents were born in Haiti. To me, it was so important to be, um, to be active. So that's also one of the reasons why right now I can't run um, for the Green Party, because it, be, it would become a conflict of interest uh, with my association with World Vision, the NHL and the NHLPA, to the, for the hospital that we're rebuilding in Haiti. So I've been there five times since the earthquake. And, uh, to me, it's so important that I finish this project before I do anything else because uh, that's where I'm from, and I feel so fortunate again that, that I'm just here today to talk about, uh, you know, to talk about, you know, anything, and that I'm healthy because uh, the one thing that I've learned, and when I, when I go to Haiti, and that's maybe why I've always been really so given. I do lots of stuff in the, in the community, and and I give back as much as I can. I do a lot of hospital visits and a lot of schools visit is, um, you know, I've been there twice when I was a kid, and I saw people dying from starvation, uh, kids that are really, really sick. But the one thing that I realized um, really quick when I was going to Haiti and compared to living in Canada is that even though here in Canada, like, we're, we're more fortunate, we're, we're richer, we, we don't want to work, we have welfare, we, we, we take everything for granted. And uh, even people that live on the street here, um, in other countries. Um, people that live on the street here eat better than some other countries that some people that have money. It, it's unbelievable how fortunate we are here. But when I go to Haiti and I see people that are starving and they have real reason to complain, I see people dancing, singing, finding these ways to live. And that's unbelievable. That's passion. That's people that are rich in heart and emotion. And you can't teach that. And here we complain about the traffic or hockey team, music. There's nothing that is right here in Canada. And when you see that, and, and you see other countries where people have real reason, and you see the way they're reacting, it's so inspiring to see that, that to me it changed my life. It just it makes me realize that criticism is nothing. Because you know what? I'm going to cry or be sad because people criticize me because 
in hockey, I didn't do this, or because in my life I didn't do that. Well, I could be dying today, and I'm not, and I'm living. So just for that reason, we should be so fortunate for that. And, and I tell people all the time, you know, you want to do something for your kids? Instead of going to Walt Disney and, uh, and, and going to those beautiful rides and see uh, beautiful places, bring, to, bring your kids to a poor country. It's the best thing you could do for their education because they're going to grow up. They're going to grow up as great human beings. They're going to understand life, what life is all about. And it's going to change them forever. And they're going to have great basic, and they're not going to take things for granted. They're going to work harder. They're going to have better work ethic. And they're going to know what real life is because there's way more poor people in this world than people that are rich. And again, once you go there and it makes you cry, man, me, it changed me when I was a kid. And maybe that's why when I was in school and everything that I did, I worked harder because I looked at myself as one of those kids. And you know how many of those kids would love to be in a position to have a chance to work? Like so many of us here don't want to work because it's too hard. But every time immigrants come to Canada and they work harder than us and we complain there's too many of them, but they do all the work, then you know, we have to figure out why, right? So those are all messages to me that when I talk to people, it's always so important to do so. And, and when I talk to parents, because those are the stuff at the end of the day that, that will be making a huge difference. Because all together, we can make a difference. And whether you're somebody that is well-known or not, everybody has a message um, you know, to tell others. And it's like a grain. You, know, you tell someone or tell somebody else, and that's how we improve uh, the society and the world that we're living every day. And all together, um, we could all do it. It's easy. And it's not a matter of race, a matter of culture, or anything. Just a matter of what's in your heart. And uh, once your heart is in the right place, you could do amazing things. And everything, every dream is possible. Just believe in it. And people that are negative, push them aside. You know, I've always thought that, you know, the most important thing in life is to be positive and to smile. You know, often, you know, people don't smile. They're always upset. And, and if you are, you, you can't achieve anything that way. You know, if you look at somebody that smiles, you're going to smile back at them. It's just natural. You want to be surrounded by people like that. You want to be that person that is uplifting to others when you talk to them and then the people want to be around you. And that way, that's where you can achieve anything that you want in life. And that's why to me, it's so important every day because life is short. You never know when it's going to be the end for you. So that's why it's important to live your life to the fullest. Always be happy and never live with regrets. Do everything you can at 100% and you can you could achieve anything that you want. Good luck. I think, I think we have a, do question, five minutes for questions? Yeah, yeah if you guys have some question about anything. Come up to the mic and yeah. Okay. The mic that is right there. Don't be shy, I don't bite. <laughs> Especially that I'm vegan, I really don't bite. <laughs> Hi, George. I never saw you play hockey. The last time I watched the hockey game was when Ken Dryden was playing. Um, I participate in sports. Uh, 25 years ago, I entered the longest cross-country ski marathon, and the world felt that it would be a shame to ski so far, not for a cause, so I raised money for cancer research. Nobody in the event was invited to raise money for anything. Uh, since then, I've spent the last 25 years inviting people to raise money in existing, essentially, non-fundraising athletic events throughout the world. A lot of money has been raised, and I'd like to give this to you. I'd like you to look at it. Uh, I saw nobody else was coming up here to answer your question, so I didn't want you to feel lonely. So uh, I hope that you'll consider it. The Green Party is considering it. It's an effort to raise money for each and every environmental organization throughout Canada and hopefully eventually throughout the world using third party existing essentially non fundraising athletic events. Okay. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Yes? Hi. Um, well, you have a lot of variety in your work and what you've done and all that. So I was wondering, with your business personality, what are some of the steps you've had to take in order to adapt it to all the different stuff that you've done? Um, well, the thing is, is when once I started became vegan, that's when a lot of things changed around me. And people that own vegan restaurants started approaching me, and people in, uh, in the health business uh, really uh, thought that I could be a good, great role model for them. So I was really picky about what I decided to join, like uh, as Crudescent is a raw vegan restaurant and uh, I have a juicer in the market and uh, I'm part of their um, um, couple companies like um, 
uh, agri agriculture company that is indoor and, and stuff like this, which is all regarding health. So all I do is now I just pick stuff that is, that is good for health and, and nothing to do with uh, um, stuff that is unhealthy for people. And then once you stick with that all the time, I just think that it's, it's a brand that I started to, to, to be around. So people know that if I endure something, it has to be something that is healthy. And often athletes, when you endure stuff, you endorse, I'm not going to say the name, but you endorse some restaurant chains that, that are cancer food or stuff that you drink that are cancer stuff too. And, and I just think it's so important because once you're a role model and kids are following your step, it's so important to endorse the right stuff because if they choose your path or your inspiration for them, it's really important to pick the right stuff that you want to do. Thank you for enormously for this great Thank you. Have a great day, guys.